I liked it. Ah, okay. You are the... Okay, I want to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me to this uh, extremely pleasant event. Um, let me start by saying that uh, I, I have known uh, Ricardo for quite a long time. I think it goes back to the 70s, probably the early 70s, I'm not sure. Probably we first met at CERN. Uh, and, uh, you know, our friendship extends, of course, to the families, the wives, the children who are roughly the same age. And uh, as an example, my daughter was recently in Florence and just uh, took a trip to Pisa just to, to meet with your daughter. Um, now, um, in physics, I think we have a similar taste for physics, uh, trying to keep a certain distance both from pure math and for pure data cranking, uh, but not identical. So our word lines in the sense of research uh, actually crossed only uh, on rare occasion in the early 80s. And in fact, uh, with, uh, with Ricardo, we co-authored two papers, which I will briefly mention. Uh, so they had to do with compositeness, in a sense. One was about um, gauge bosons being composite of fundamental fermions in a paper we wrote with, uh, with Daniele Amati and Anne Davis. Um, and uh, the second one was about composite uh, quarks and leptons uh, within some kind of uh, supersymmetric technicolor-like theories starting with some <clears throat> effective Lagrangian, adding soft breaking terms, and so on. Now, uh, I didn't dare to give a talk about this subject, which seems to uh, smell mold. Do you say it like that in English? <laughs> okay. It's a dimuffa. <laughs> and so my decision was a hard one, because I don't think anything of them doing at the moment I really very much online with the present interest of Ricardo. So I had the choice between something which looks more particle-like, which is high energy gravitational scattering, but which has very little to do with actual data. And the, the alternative was to talk about some cosmological work I have been doing recently, which is a bit far from particles, but on the other hand is closer to the data. And I think I I finally decided for this latter uh, subject, um, also because I am a little bit sick and tired of talking about the other one. <laughs> so, um, so we'll be talking about the universe and actually the late part of the uh, of the evolution of the universe. I mean, uh, actually, the talk, as the title indicates, is more general. Well, I'll talk about some coordinate system, which seem to be quite interesting and useful. And then in the application, we'll try to concentrate on the question of dark energy today or in our recent past. OK. Um, so as an introduction, uh, you know that most of cosmology is based on observing and interpreting light or light-like signals. And uh, uh, light photons travel on null geodesics, which lie on our past light cone, the one which reaches us. Now, if you are in Friedman, Robertson, Walker space time, then it's easy, of course, to define our past light cone and the geodesics which lie on, there, on them. But uh, in the presence of inhomogeneities, and the universe is fairly inhomogeneous today, um, our past light cone and the null geodesics become quite messy. And the question we have been asking is whether we can simplify our, our life by a suitable choice of coordinates. The answer will be apparently yes, and if so, what can we do with those coordinates? So the outline is roughly like this. Uh, I will introduce this so-called gauge, which is a coordinate choice, and some of its properties, which 
you know, we think are quite remarkable in the sense that we started to introduce them for some reason, and then as we kept working on different problems, they seemed to simplify life also for other questions. And then, as I said, the, uh, the main application I will present will be to the question of dark energy, the study of dark energy via supernova 1A. Uh, so I will briefly recall the Hubble diagram in uh, Friedman Roberts of Walker cosmology. And then I will come to the application of this gauge to, to discuss the average and the dispersion in the, uh, in the uh, relation between the luminosity distance and the redshift, you know, which is the Hubble diagram, and uh, within a realistic universe, where we, we think would be both uh, theoretically motivated and also realistic uh, universe in, in terms of, its, of the power spectrum. Uh, and then we reach some conclusions on dark energy parameter determination. And I will conclude by mentioning some open problems. This is really work in progress uh, on what these uh, coordinates could be good for. So uh, this is about as complicated as it will get. So there will not be many details in this uh, short presentation. Uh, now, this, uh, we are what we call geodetic, geodetic light cone gauge is some fully gauge fixed. When I say fully gauge fixed, is mod modulo coordinate transformations which depend on less than four coordinates. Uh, fully gauge fixed variant of some coordinates which had been introduced by George Ellis et al. And uh, they have this kind of line element. Uh, the coordinates are called tau for some time coordinate. W will be a null coordinate. And 1 and 2 are basically angles, OK, the two angles. And the metric takes this, uh, has this form, this line element form. I cannot quite see the screen myself. So. And, I, and this doesn't work. Never mind. So, OK, I write the metric also and its inverse. And please note that there, there, there are quite some interesting zeros. For instance, uh, in the lower index metric, uh, d tau only couples to dw. So the first line has only one non-zero entry. And in the inverse metric, the opposite happens. Uh, if you have a, a, an upper index w, then the only non-vanishing entry is Again, the off diagonal uh, tau w thing and g tau tau with upper indices is minus one. Now, just to have an idea of what these coordinates mean, let's look at them in the. Sorry, sometimes I have Friedman, Roberts, or Walker, sometimes I have put in also Lemaitre, uh, it's the same thing. Um, so, in, the, uh, in that limit, tau is really cosmic time, uh, W is the radial coordinate plus the conformal time eta. Uh, this epsilon is simply the scale factor. There is no shift vector, UA, and the uh, two by two metric in this angular coordinates is simply uh, the, uh, the, 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 two, the, the two sphere with the, with the scale factor on top. But this is general, and okay, if you count the number of functions this metric depends on, it depends on six functions, okay, epsilon. There are two shift vectors, UA, and there are three uh, uh, components of this two by two matrix. Now, the properties of these coordinates is that constant W uh, hypersurfaces are light cones. And in particular, so if you fix W equals some W0, this defines our past light cone. One has to uh, stress that these coordinates are very simple for one observer, OK? So we take, of course, a very egocentric point of view. And we are the observers. And along our world line, we can define these past light cones at, at all times, in our past, in our future, or today. 
and uh, W equal constant hypersurfaces provide the foliation of space-time. The coordinate tau can be identified with the synchronous gauge time. Uh, static geodesic observers in the synchronous gauge have a very simple <coughs> velocity, which is given by d mu tau, and photons travel on the slight cones at fixed W, of course, because they travel on the light cone, but also at fixed thetas, at fixed angles in this particular coordinate system, and their momentum is simply given by d mu w. Now, there are other nice properties of this gauge. For instance, a simple expression for the red shift. Now, you know very well that in Friedman, Robertson, Walker cosmology, the red shift is very simple. It factorizes in terms of entries of the standard metric uh, by the famous formula, one plus z is just the ratio of the scale factor at the observer divided by the scale factor at the source. Now, the same happens uh, in a generic uh, universe, non-homogeneous, non-isotropic, in this gauge, this property remains true, and the, uh, the, the redshift is simply the ratio of that entry of the metric, which I call epsilon, at the observer divided by the same quantity at the source. In general, however, of course, this will not depend just on, on tau, or, or, but it will depend on all four coordinates because you are in a generic space time. And what I, we did more recently in this paper is that we could actually obtain a simple and exact, quote-unquote, <coughs> expression for this called, so-called Jacobi map, which I will remind you what its definition is, which is a quantity which is usually quite hard to compute. You can compute it in cosmological perturbation theory. I think people manage to do it up to second order, but with a lot of work. Now, it's quite amazing that in these coordinates, the Jacobi map takes it's a very simple and uh, exact form. The Jacobi map is a way to solve the, to express the solution of the geodesic deviation equation. You, you take a, <coughs> a bundle of uh, null geodesics which emerge from a common origin and you study how you know, they depart from each other. So you have this vector psi mu, which is the distance between two nearby geodesics, and it satisfies this well-known equation. Now you project this psi mu, which is a four vector, on two, uh, on two vectors, S mu A, with, where capital A goes from one to two, which are, orth which are uh, orthogonal both to the velocity of the observer and to the ve velocity of the, of the photons themselves. They are normalized and, uh, and so on. And then for this, it's like projecting this, um, this uh, distance vectors on an orthogonal screen. And this is what you really uh, are interested in, in uh, from, from the point of view of measurements. They satisfy a slightly different uh, uh, deviation equation where this RAB is not a Ricci tensor, is the Riemann tensor contracted with two Ks and two of these uh, uh, Sachs uh, four vectors. And uh, so uh, now this is just a rewriting of the previous transparency. Now the Jacobi map is defined by the solution of that equation expressed in that way. So you want to compute this deviation at the source in terms of, uh, of a metric, a two by two matrix, which then multiplies a certain normalizing quantity which is defined at the, um, at the origin of, the, of, of this bundle of geodesics. And uh, okay, the Jacobi map has to uh, satisfy uh, a similar equation with the same R a, B, appearing there with some initial conditions. It has to be zero when the source and the observer coincide, of course. 
and then it has a certain first derivative condition on it. And the rather amazing thing is that in these coordinates, you can write down the solution to this equation and modulo a normalization factor again, which is defined at the source of the, of, of the bundle. Uh, it, it only, it is completely determined by what I call here S, uh, this SAA, -A, uh, which in this gauge are simply Zwei binds for this two by two matrix gamma AB. Remember in the metric, I had this angular gamma AB. Now you can introduce a Zwei bind for this metric and, uh, and the Jacobi map is given directly in terms of the Zwei bind. And uh, what is nice is that this expression is bilocal, okay, it's a quantity computed at, the, at, at wherever you put your source, times another quantity uh, computed at the observer. It factorizes nicely. And of course, this expression is not covariant. Certainly, a covariant expression valid in all gauges would be highly non-local. But, uh, but it's true in this gauge. And this could be very useful for strong gravitational lensing, caustics, and so on. And this is work we have in progress. But for today, I, I will concentrate on a byproduct of this Jacobi map, which is the area or the luminosity distance, which is what you, uh, what you use when you, when you have this uh, Hubble, Hubble diagram. So uh, actually we got in this coordinates a formula for the uh, luminosity distance before this work on the Jacobi map. But now that we have the Jacobi map, it's even easier because it's well known that the so-called area distance, dA squared, is simply given by the determinant of this two by two matrix. And uh, well, I don't want now to enter in definitions. The real interesting thing is uh, DL, is the luminosity distance, because that's what you measure. And uh, it is simply related in terms of the redshift to DA. So in these coordinates, both the redshift and the luminosity distance take a very simple form. Furthermore, this form seems to be non-perturbative. Now, there may be situation in which the coordinates themselves become pathological at some point. So I don't want to sell it to oversell, but certainly at least within a perturbed friedman roberts walker universe, these things hold true. Now, so now we can try to apply this to the to dark energy. I remind you of the concordance model of cosmology, where three sets of data seem to point at dark energy. Uh, well, that's a famous diagram where you see the, uh, the CMB constraint, which tells us roughly that the universe is spatially flat. You have the clusters, which seem to indicate that the, the matter energy density is below critical. And finally, the supernovae, which, uh, as we will remind you in a moment, indicate that you know, omega matter and omega lambda should be in a certain relation. Uh, this you have seen already, I think, in one of the previous talks. So this gives this famous composition, cosmic composition pi, which has been slightly changed after Planck, but still, okay, it's roughly uh, dominating dark energy today then dark matter, and finally baryons. Now, I want to emphasize that two of the arguments for dark energy, those due to clusters and those due to CMB, are really based on inhomogeneities, right? On the formation of structure in the universe or, or in the CMB. Now, the third argument for dark energy ignores completely, I mean, as it's usually formulated, ignores completely the inhomogeneities because it's based on the famous Hubble diagrams of redshift versus luminosity, which is drawn for 
a perfectly uh, um, homogeneous and uh, isotropic universe. So just a quick reminder also to give you the definition of the L squared. So the luminosity distance is simply related to the flux that you observe. So if you have standard candles, in other words, if you know uh, uh, if, you, if you know the luminosity, maybe up to an overall factor for all supernovae, then the luminosity distance is directly related to the observed flux. And uh, in, in Friedman, Roberts, or Walker, uh, this luminosity distance can be computed directly. Uh, here is the simplest example of a flat lambda CDM universe, but you can generalize it easy to a multi-component universe with curvature uh, by a formula like that. And I remind you that if you expand this relation between the L and the Z, you find, of course, the Hubble law to linear order in Z, but the corrections of order Z square depend on the composition of, uh, of the universe. Uh, and this acceleration parameter or deceleration parameter Q0 is directly related to the difference between omega matter and two omega lambda. And if that quantity is negative, it means that the universe is actually accelerating rather than decelerating. And I mean, fixing this Q0 gives basically that uh, line in the, uh, in the omega m, omega lambda diagram. Now, and OK, using type 1 supernova, standard candles gave this evidence for dark, for dark energy. But it's all done within a Friedman, Roberts, or Walker cosmology. Now, the universe is fairly homogeneous only on very large scales. And uh, so the question is, what is the effect of small scale inhomogeneities on this relation? The answer is not completely obvious, because um, averaging physical quantities in general relativity uh, does not mean, uh, or better, averaged, averaged physical quantities do not obey the homogeneous Einstein equations. There are extra uh, terms, which are called typically back reaction terms of how inhomogeneities, inhomogeneities back react on the, uh, they act at extra sources on the Friedman, uh, Robertson, Walker equations. So this uh, averaging problem has been a rather hot subject in, rec in recent years, perhaps a little bit less now. And there have been even have been hopes that inhomogeneities might explain cosmic acceleration without any need for dark energy. That would have been extremely nice because you give a natural resolution of the famous coincidence problem, why acceleration happens now, okay, would be related to the fact that uh, nonlinear uh, structures, I mean, uh, big inhomogeneities are a recent phenomenon in the universe. Now, of course, this sounds too optimistic given the other evidences for dark energy, but uh, it is still important to, to ask the question of uh, how inhomogeneities may affect precision cosmology in the future, okay? To which extent can we neglect inhomogeneities when we try to determine, for instance, dark energy parameters like the equation of state on the, or the derivative of the equation of state of dark energy. Now, most of previous work was dealing with spatial averages of inhomogeneities and with rather formal definitions of acceleration. Okay, you take some kind of expansion rate and you, and, and, and you, uh, you take its derivative and the average and so on. But this could be rather tricky and gauge-dependent uh, objects. So um, what we did was to actually look directly at how to average the uh, DLZ relation. So directly the, the physical observable, which is guaranteed to be gauge invariant and physical. 
So uh, what we developed in the same paper where we introduced these coordinates, and these are the authors, uh, was a way to do, um, in a gauge invariant way, averages over light cones, which, okay, I should explain better what that means, but, um, well, okay, roughly speaking, the, the thing which is relevant for this talk is this last average. So you see here I depict the, our past light cone, and then I cut it through a space-like hypersurface, which can be, uh, for instance, identified with a fixed redshift hypersurface. So by doing this, you cut a, sp a sphere, right? This is indicated as a circle, but clearly one dimension is missing. So on this sphere, we have supernovae, say, with given redshift. And the question is to compute the, lum the, the luminosity distance point by point on this sphere, which will now will be a function of the angular coordinate. And uh, what it turns out to be quite interesting is that if we consider not the average of the luminosity distance itself, but the average of the physical quantity that you measure, the flux, which is proportional to the dl to the minus 2, uh, so notice I do the average of dl to the minus 2 and not the average of dl to the power minus 2, that simplifies life quite a lot. And uh, it turns out that this average is simply given by the inverse of the average area uh, of the, yeah, of the average of the area element. You see this integral d2 theta gamma to the one half is simply the area element. So it's very natural, but this comes out to be a, an exact relation. Now. If we want to make this average at a fixed redshift, Zs, as for source, then we have to fix the tau coordinate on the sphere to be such that uh, it imposes this fixed redshift condition. So these two equations have to be solved simultaneously, but you <coughs> should appreciate the simplicity of this being also non-perturbative, that both the luminosity distance and the redshift are expressed in terms of very simple quantities entering in this metric, epsilon and gamma. Sorry, they look a little bit too much the same. Now, so the intersection of the, the W equal W0 hypersurface, which is our past light cone, and Z equal Zs, uh, is this two surface, which is topologically a sphere, on which the supernovae of given redshift are located. Now, uh, this formula is exact. It can be used for any specific inhomogeneous model. For instance, you could also take a so-called LTB model, Le Maitre Tolman Bondi universe, in which the metric is fixed, is not homogeneous. Uh, it's uh, spherically symmetric. You put yourself at the center of this symmetry, and then you can compute everything. But this is not very realistic, and it's not very Copernican. So a, a more realistic model is the one produced by inflation, in which you have a stochastic background of perturbations, which is statistically isotropic and homogeneous. As a result, when you compute this average, you find vanishing effects at first order, and you, you have to go to second order if you want the power spectrum is what will determine the final result, at least to second order. OK, unfortunately, uh, perturbations are not studied in this gauge, are normally studied in other gauges. For instance, a very popular one, uh, the Newtonian, or a longitudinal gauge, or the Poisson gauge to higher order. And so all the work we have to do is to find the coordinate transformation from our coordinates to the more usual ones. And this is quite a lot of work. I think it's yet easier than starting directly in the Poisson gauge and computing everything there, DL and so on and so forth. I happen to be in the plane with uh, 
Filippo Vernizzi yesterday, and then he mentioned to me this work where they did this computation in the Poisson gauge directly, and he told me that it was quite a lot of work. So now we should compare our result with theirs. Um, then from here on, the calculation proceeds in two steps. So the first is what I explained. We take this expression for the flux, for the L to the minus two, and we work it out to second order in cosmological perturbation theory in a standard gauge like the Poisson gauge. Um, uh, and then next, we have to perform the appropriate light cone integrals to average the effect over the sky. Um, and uh, we compute the average and also the dispersion. Now, part of the calculation is analytic. You can do some of the integrals pretty easily. But there are many, many terms. By the way, this is, was the subject of the thesis of my PhD student, who graduated uh, in September. And uh, part is numerical, because we have to insert some kind of realistic power spectrum for the perturbations. Uh, if you want to see a summary, I refer you to this. Uh, I can't see. Ten. Oh, plenty. Now, um, one interesting thing is that you can also compute the effect on other quantity, other functions of the luminosity distance. For instance, the luminosity distance itself. And the result depends on the observable. Namely, OK, as I said, the average of a function is not the function of the average. And uh, it's quite amazing that the flux also stands out, probably because of some conservation theorem, as the uh, observable which is least affected by inhomogeneities. And you see, this is a fractional correction due to the inhomogeneities on the flux. Uh, it is small. You see, typically, at red shifts of order 0.1 to 1 is of order 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5. Whereas, for instance, if you took the, the distance itself and average it, it's considerably larger. In any case, it is clear that it has nothing to do with an acceleration. So uh, it's not a way to exp It's too small and also has the wrong dependence on redshift to simulate dark energy. Uh, the results of the final numerical calculation are somewhat sensitive to the power spectrum that we use. We used essentially the halo fit model that Scott Cimaro, for instance, and others have been developing. And it's very important to take also some non-linearity effects in the in the power spectrum, namely in this transfer function that uh, Tony Riotto was talking about. And you see, for instance, there's a big difference between the linear spectrum and the, which is here, and the non-linear spectrum. And uh, uh, the, the, the final results are perfectly infrared and ultraviolet convergent. They depend, depending on what you measure, uh, average or dispersion, they depend a little bit on exactly how uh, the power spectrum, uh, which power spectrum you use. But, okay, this is the basic result that we get. Let me explain to you what, what, they, what this means. So you have a, um, let's see, maybe I should show it here. Um, so the solid line, the solid line is, uh, is our result for the, for the uh, well, here is the magnitude versus redshift relation. When we take a reference value for omega lambda, here we took 0.73. It doesn't matter, okay? You take a, a reasonable value. Now, the, uh, the dotted lines, forget about the shade for the moment, the dotted lines are the predictions if you are Friedman, Robertson, Walker with a different omega lambda, okay? So um, um, 
so at, at small red shift, they all coincide because, okay, at small red shift, you just have, have the Hubble low. But as you go to bigger red shift, of course, different omega lambda give different curves, which are these dotted lines. Now, the fact that um, the line at 0.73 is indistinguishable from the solid line means that the effect on this average is absolutely invisible in this diagram. So the reason to plot this diagram is to show that there is also a dispersion due to this fluctuation, and that the dispersion, which is indicated by this band, is as big as a few percent variation in omega lambda, particularly if you use the nonlinear power spectrum of matter. So, um, so the conclusion is that for the average, really, the effect is tiny, but there is scatter, of course, since the in a non-homogeneous <coughs> non, uh, universe, you look at different directions in the sky, you'll, you'll find a slightly different relation between DL and Z. Uh, okay, well, this is superimposing some data, but let me skip this. We also compared the dispersion that we get, which is this solid line with something that people have been fitting with, and we seem to of course, there are many origins for dispersion. <clears throat> uh, so I think people have tried to subtract as many known effects as possible and come up with some kind of intrinsic dispersion, which we seem to reproduce very well. So let me conclude. Uh, the inhomogeneity is of a stochastic type cannot mimic dark energy, okay? I stress that if you start with a classically inhomogeneous in universe, then you can do whatever you want. But, so within this model, dark energy looks there to stay with all its mystery. Now, if you average the appropriate observables, you get negligible corrections to the uh, standard results. And in principle, you can attain a 10 to the minus 5 precision without any uh, important corrections from, from these inhomogeneities. However, there are these effects on the variance and dispersions which are much larger and seem to, uh, may limit the determination of dark energy parameters, at least if you only use this supernova data, to a few percent level if you have limited statistics. And, uh, Yes, I want to conclude with what else we can do with these coordinates. I think we can try to improve treatment of gravitational lensing when a perturbative approach is inadequate, for instance, in the presence of caustics, uh, which have a, we believe have a very simple characterization in, uh, in these coordinates. Uh, when the rank of the matrix gamma AB is less than two, so it can be zero or one, uh, you have a caustic, and we are trying now to understand how to go through these caustics. Um, then, uh, then we would like to give a non-perturbative argument for the smallness or otherwise of homogeneity effects on this uh, Z-DL uh, relation. Uh, as I said, we went to second order, but you know, people have been asking the question, I mean, is it enough to go to second order? What will happen if you go to third order? So since we, we can start with some non-perturbative formula, the hope is to be able to, uh, to transform this into a non-perturbative argument for the, I think, for the smallness of these effects. And finally, even more ambitious would be to set up Einstein's equations, at least <coughs> Uh, cosmological perturbation theory directly in these coordinates and some preliminary investigations of the Hamiltonian constraint, Aichadori equation seem to be encouraging. Certainly the domain of dependence is very simple because only what is inside your past light cone can affect you and, uh, and uh, we have a simple characterization of the past light cones. 
So we are looking forward to still more fun to come, uh, which is also my best wish to Ricardo. Uh, I think that uh, passion and fun go very well together. And, uh, and finally, I want to say that also my wife, who couldn't be here, joins you uh, in wishing you all the best. This is a picture we took, I think you remember, in May after this uh, colloquium I organized um, on Boson Nome Higgs, where Ricardo gave a nice talk. I think you are all freezing. Uh, it was end of May, but it was so. <laughs> and even in the restaurant, it was pretty bad. So, okay, all the best, Ricardo. <laughs> something. Can you hear me? So yes. some, some of these conclusions about the unimportance of uh, stochastic effects were, and homogeneities were obtained using effective field theory techniques. Can be obtained. Well, can be obtained or have been obtained. No, I have been obtained. Yeah. I, I didn't... Yeah, so, so can you compare the two approaches? Which one is more powerful, which one is easier to implement, and so on? Well, no, we, we haven't done it yet. I know that um, talking to people that, you know, most people find that the result is absolutely what you expected anyway. Uh, uh, the smallness of the effect, you say. Uh, but, okay. Um, also making predictions, not just smallness, right? You can compute. You can compute the, the effect. Um, well, I, th I think here the, the hope is that you, you can simplify your calculations and maybe you can, as I mentioned at the end, you, you may hope to be able to construct a non-perturbative result a non-perturbative argument. I'm not sure you can do that in this effective approach. I don't know enough about it, but uh, in which sense I heard... Non -perturbative? Huh? In which sense non-perturbative? Like, what is here non-perturbative? Non the, the expression for, uh, for DL and for Z. But you cannot solve the short distance dynamics, which is, non which is the source of non-perturbative. I mean, the only source of non-perturbative here is the fact that the short distance dynamics, you know, the non became non-linear. Yeah, and, but you uh, may you, be able... You cannot solve that, yeah, right? Yeah, I understand. But you, you may be able to connect two things. I mean, like saying, suppose I want a big effect on the DLZ relation, okay? Which we can write down in a closed form. And then maybe by asking to get a big effect, you get a contradiction elsewhere. So this would be the type of, of argument you want to build up, even without being able to, to actually compute. Yes, to actually do the computation, you need to set up uh, Einstein's equation, but I have no hope that you know, life will be simple. <coughs> So I, I'm not claiming that we can solve the equations non-perturbatively for these quantities, gamma and epsilon. But the point is that maybe by imposing that there is one effect in one observable, you'll find a contradiction in another observable. So this would be the line, the philosophy, I guess. So I, I find that, that at the end, the, the effect is not so small, in the sense uh, the scatter is big, the, the scatter. dispersion is big, but uh, is it coming from uh, uh, peculiar velocities of okay. supernovae? Uh, or? Uh, no, uh, not at large z. At large z is coming from Lensing. At small z is coming from peculiar velocity. So there are two effects. Actually, here I could have improved the picture by super 
This curve is a superposition of two curves. One which is due to peculiar velocity, which is big at a small z. And, oh, in fact, it's there. OK, it's this dotted line and this. So this is, sorry, I didn't see it. Um, so this is peculiar velocity, and this is mainly lensing. Yeah.